Welcome to Growing Your Firm, brought to you by Jetpack Workflow. We're here to help firms unlock the secrets to help you reach your goals faster. And now, here's your host, founder and CEO of Jetpack Workflow, David Cristello. Hey, everybody. David Cristello here, founder and CEO of Jetpack Workflow and host of Growing Your Firm podcast. Today's guest is Billy Angelo. If you've been following me on LinkedIn, you might recognize this name. Why? because I am following his commentary all the time. We're getting conversations back and forth on LinkedIn. But if you don't know Billy, Billy is the managing partner of Angelo and Associates, championing out of the box, thinking to steer small businesses, specifically private practice owners towards financial clarity and success with over 20 years in the accounting industry. Billy is dedicated to providing tailored tax and financial solutions that enhance profitability and growth. I am really, excited to do this interview because I think Billy's been very prolific and I've been following his content. There's a lot of different takes he has in the industry. So we'll probably jump around. Of course, we're going to talk about cash. We're going to talk about tax season. We're going to talk about probably pricing and a million other things. But Billy, welcome to the show. Nice to be here, Dave. Yeah. So I, I, I want to start things off. I know we're it's like cash. We're going to dig into cash. But you mentioned something right before I hit record, and I was like, that's not a phrase I hear very often. You said tax season is not as big of a deal for your firm as it is for other firms. So what did you, I got a preview of it, but I'm curious, what did you mean by that? Yes. What we did a couple of years ago was we identified right after tax season, we identified what were the, like what caused the major fires during tax season. And you make a list of them. And then you look at the list and patterns and it's almost like what, what always- What were examples? What were his examples of some of those patterns? So cool. it's usually uh, 1040 clients, people that there's no relationship with the person outside of annual personal tax preparation, right? So you're seeing these people once a year, yeah. giving you the W-2s or 1099s and you're doing their 1040. This is essentially a commoditized service at this point. And we're happy to do it. And when everything goes right, it can be profitable. But one out of 10 times or every once in a while, things go wrong. The client refuses to comply. They will not, you can ask them a hundred times for their mortgage statement or their, their kid's daycare info or something as, as small as that, but you can't get the tax return out the door until they give you all the information. So you're sending yeah. 500 emails, we're getting annoyed. The client's getting annoyed. And they're like, oh, I have until April 15th. So what's the big deal? Meanwhile, you have all these other clients you're taking care of. And we just noticed that between the 1040 clients, which are once a year engagements, and also we were handling some business clients on an annual basis also. They didn't have a need for a bookkeeper or an accountant during the course of the year. So they would just come in in February, March, or April and give us their QuickBooks file or whatever their, wherever their books were kept. And then we would do their corporate tax return or their partnership tax return. But again, every once in a while, there's a yep. major problem in their books. You're finding something from the previous May or June or something. The client doesn't even remember it. We need these questions answered in order to be able to do the tax return. And you're having a very difficult time doing 12 months of work in one shot during your busiest time of year. So we made a conscious decision. We actually offboarded probably over half of our 1040 clients, which for us was massive. You're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars of revenue. And we released these clients over the course of a few years just to really drill down on the work that we are really good at and the work that we really like doing and the work that we feel adds the most value to our clients. Because let's be honest, someone comes in to get their 1040 done. Again, it's transactional. It's it's commoditized. You're not, you could do the best job in the world. You're not really adding that much value to that person's life. They might be happy with you for that week or whatever when they get their big refund. But for the most part, the value add comes from a different subset of client. And that's where we tend to just really spend all of our time and energy focusing on those people. So by default, because we're managing these people during the course of the year, their QuickBooks can't become a dumpster fire because we're managing it all year. 
So yeah. all of a sudden it's February and it's, okay, I'm going to do the 1120 or the 1065. I'm going to do the tax return. And it's easy because I'm the bookkeeper on it. I'm the accountant on it. So it's very easy to make that transition from one role to another for those clients. When you made that decision, so 50% of your 1040s, you said over the course of a few years, you offboarded them. What does that practically look like? Are you meeting them, emailing them? Are you, did you sell it off? Did you refer them to another firm? Like, How did you manage that process? We got better at that process as years went on, but we every year we got slightly better in steps. So the first year, first of all, let me just rewind for a second. I'm sure there's a lot of people that are going to be listening to this and they're saying, I just raise everyone's fees to the point where I'll just triple their fee or double their fee or raise it by some large percentage. And if they don't like it, they can go someplace else. But if they yeah. do like it or they are okay with it, I should say, then we'll keep doing the work at this higher fee. And I understand that logically, but ethically, I have a problem with that. This is not a $1,000, $1,500 service. The market rate for this type of thing is maybe five or $600. And I'm not comfortable doubling my rates, even if you agree to it, because I know that this is too much for the service. So we, that was another decision that we had to make along the way was, we're not going to just blindly start raising fees through the roof to try to discourage people from using us. Instead, we're going to say, you know, we're going to send a, a letter or an email, whatever the case is, or call them up and say, our firm is going in a different direction, which it was. We're focusing on these type of clients, these type of engagements. You are not in that category. So I think you'd be a better fit if you went someplace else. So you're doing the right thing by the client. They, the client deserves to be with a firm who does have a process in place to handle this 1040 volume once a year. Mm -hmm. So were, we were like clients it, it, upset? Did you, or were they like, what was the reaction when you sent that, that note out? Whether people were upset or not, I'm not sure, but we didn't get any negative feedback whatsoever. We got all really positive feedback. The preponderance of the responses were something along the lines of, dude, congrats, sounds awesome, good luck in your new focus. That was really the vibe of the message that we wow. received back. Yeah. And when I was talking to my team about it, we had the same concern. Are people going to be insulted? And I tried to think about it in terms of other service providers, right? If I'm the patient at a dentist office, and I've had the same dentist for the past 10 or 20 years or whatever. And then one day I get a letter from the dentist and the letter says, we're no longer going to be doing teeth cleans. We're only doing whatever oral surgery or something like that. I'm not going to be mad at the guy. I might say, ah, oh, geez, like now I have to find someone else That's to annoying, do my yeah. teeth cleaning twice a year or whatever, but I'm not mad at the dentist. I don't feel insulted that the dentist is choosing to, to niche down and focus on this one specific part of his profession. So therefore we should, we're, it's a parallel analogy and cross our fingers. And that was really the response that we got. That's amazing. So you niche down and essentially, correct me if I'm wrong, every 1040 you're doing is part of a monthly business accounting package. Is that, or 99% of the large majority is part of that? Is that fair to say? Okay. Yeah. Yes. We still have my, my roommates from college and my aunt Linda and stuff like that yeah. are just once a year type people. But for yeah. the most part, 99%, like you said, are, we do the 1040 as an extension of the business relationship that we have with them during the course of the year. Yeah. I, I think you should jack your roommate's price up to four X and see what they say. I think you can No. the, so something you mentioned in the pre-interview and we've been talking about this for a while, there's a couple of areas we can dive into, but you mentioned CAS for small CPA firms. How are you offering advisory services to small business clients? I think a lot of the perspective I keep hearing in the industry, which is to do monthly transactional work. Yes, I think my clients gladly accept that in many cases. But if I want to do advisory work, if I want to help them think about the future, they get a lot of pushback. So I'm curious how you approach, how you A, first define CAS, and then B, how you approach it in a creative way for the, the niche you're working in. Yeah, it's, again, it is a very hot topic. Like you pointed out, the currents of this profession, the prevailing winds are telling us like, hey, this is the way that the profession is headed. Yeah. But 
And that may or may not be true at a certain level of CPA firm, but I know for sure it's not true at the very small level. And by very small, I don't mean necessarily the size of the CPA firm, but the size of the client. So how do so, you define um, how do you define that from like a revenue perspective? Maybe not necessarily revenue, oh, okay. but more more along the lines of so a lot of our clients are private practitioners. These are people that are in professional services. It's a single owner S corporation. A lot of times there's no other employees. They might be making $80,000 a year. They might be making a million dollars a year, but the actual business itself, um, it's not this huge, robust multi locations yeah. doing work internationally or whatever. So these people are, they don't necessarily have the need or the willingness to hire a CPA firm and pay them $20,000 a month for advisory services. Even if I was able to sell that, which I think would be difficult, the client is looking for $50,000 a month worth of value if they're gonna be paying $20,000 a month in, in fees. And I could do that. Most competent CPAs could. You go and you do a deep dive of the business and you go in there and you move things around and you find these unlocked, you unlock these opportunities for them that they're not seeing and you can add value in that way. But at our client level, the, our typical profile of a client is that micro business. Again, usually one or two other employees or single owner, single location. They don't really have the need for it. Mm -hmm. They do have a need for the traditional CPA work, the bookkeeping. We're going to take yeah. care of your QuickBooks, tax compliance. At the end of the year, we're going to do your tax return. And hey, during the course of the year, because we're in your QuickBooks file, we could also advise you about estimated tax payments, right? Now, that's what we're technically engaged to do. But what happens is during the course of the year, a client will call up with a question or we'll have a question. We notice something in your books. It looks like you're paying a ton in insurance compared to last year. What happened there? Or have conversations like that. Those are advisory type conversations. Now, are you, are you seeing, so like that example is really interesting because you spotted some sort of variance in the financials, right? Like you mentioned the insurance line item. Are you using some sort of tool to, or is there a specific report you have built out to understand the variances? Or are you just allocating some extra time as you close out the books for them? You're looking at line item year over year percentage change. And the reason I'm asking, I was literally in a group meeting yesterday, a bunch of cast leaders were there. And one of the biggest struggles was like, well, how do I get my team to like think in an advisor fashion, yeah. give them space to do that. So I'm really curious whether it's a leader thinking about this for their team or it's a partner like yourself. Are you allocating the time and that's how you're catching them? Or do you have some sort of automated alert or how are you thinking about this? We're not allocating time specifically, and we do not have any sort of like special software doing it. This is just after we're done actually doing the work and you're looking at the P and L. Yeah. Does this pass the reasonable person test? Take a deep breath and take off your accountant hat and put on your, your logical person hat and just take a look at it for five seconds and just see like this number is way higher than it was last year or this number is zero. How has their rent been zero all year? Are they not paying rent anymore? Like what's happening here? Yeah. And it's those really obvious ones that jump out and that's when you pick up the phone and call the client. The client also, they're not shy about picking up the phone and calling us because we do foster this environment of call it like an open door policy. We it's flat fee billing. We do not charge for phone calls or emails or things. We're not billing hourly. It's all flat fee. We tell our clients, if you have a question, please call us. You don't have to Google. You don't have to talk to your uncle or your neighbor who owns a business and get their take on it. You're paying a CPA. We will happily give you those answers. And it's in those 10, 15, 20 minute conversations sometimes that you could answer that one question that puts them on a completely different track. They're about to do something insane. They're about to take out $100,000 out of their uh, retirement account to buy a new piece of equipment that they really need. And then we'll say, instead of doing that and paying the tax on that distribution and paying the penalty on that distribution, why don't you get a business line of credit or a home equity line of credit or something like that? And they're like, oh yeah, I didn't think about that. And all of a sudden you just save them $40,000 in tax in yeah. a five minute phone call. Yeah. So we're not billing out for CAS. We're not billing out for advisory services. So it's not a revenue stream for us, 
but it's certainly a referral stream because clients really appreciate that. You're creating goodwill in those phone calls. And who's taking the phone calls? Is it partners only or who at the firm typically triages these? Everybody. Every, anybody, everybody. Everybody. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of the, a lot of the higher view stuff ends up on my desk, whereas the day to day, Hey, we need your bank statement or even something like this doesn't look right, or we're missing something or whatever the case is that gets handled by the staff, but I have a really great staff and the staff has great relationships with the clients. So 95% of the communications are happening between the staff and the client. And then I'll just jump in if someone wants to have a talk about the direction of their business or maybe something a little bit more high view. Got it. Now you mentioned price. So what is the range, either the range or average that you price things out today? A new client comes to you, let's just call it, they're plain vanilla. You've worked with this business a million times. What are the options or the price that you're delivering to them? And how did you come up with that price point? Yeah, the price point, it started off by just an examination of time. We're going to sign a dollar per hour to each staff member, see how long a typical client takes, and then back into what that monthly fee should be. And we are, it's essentially subscription billing. We're not billing after the fact. We're ACHing every one of our clients on the fifth of the month, every single month, and they don't have to think about it. We don't have accounts receivable. We can smooth out their cash flow by doing that. It's predictable and all those things. But our fees are typically, I would say for a, a normal, like the avatar of our, of our ideal client, the mm -hmm. fee is going to be between eight and $10,000 per year. That gets broken down to about 400 to 450 per month for the accounting work. That's like our retainer. And then at the end of the year, we then have a separate fee for the corporate tax return or the partnership tax return as well as their personal tax return. So the total package ends up being somewhere in the ballpark of eight to $10,000 or so. Cool. Now, so you looked at, you looked at the time it would take to complete work for this client, and then you added your X margin on top of that. That's essentially how eight, eight to 10 K, right? To 75% of that, maybe, maybe 75 is high. Yeah, 50 to 66% is maybe your internal cost. And then the rest is margin. Is that roughly correct? More or less. So of course it depends on the client, but, um, within the whole client base, you have some clients that end up being more profitable than others, but yeah. the exercise to find out exactly who's the most profitable, who's the least profitable ends up being this gigantic undertaking that I'd rather not get into. <laughs> so we just, okay. this is what our fees are. Uh, this is in line with what other CPA firms that are doing similar type of work is doing. So we're not like way high or way low. And it was funny because one time I was talking to a client and I told him what the fees were. And he said, before I called you, I almost hired QuickBooks. They, you know, he has the QuickBooks software and then QuickBooks also offers a service that they're going to be your accountants. But this is a overseas call center. And most people aren't satisfied with having that relationship with their accountant and into its fee for that was something like, I believe he told me like in the low three hundreds per month. And I was like, if they're charging low three hundreds per month, but like, we're doing twice as good of a job at least. Yeah. Hey, growing a firm community, David here. Just want to share a quick note about Jetpack workflow or accounting workflow software now for almost a decade we've helped 5,000 plus accountants bookkeepers and firm owners use jetpack workflow to better organize accounting workflows automate recurring tasks and easily track and monitor client work never miss a deadline again stop using messy post-it notes generic tools legacy systems or spreadsheets to handle workflows and bring sanity to your client work now head on over to jetpackworkflow.com that's jetpackworkflow.com to get started with a 14-day free trial or schedule one-on-one -on -one demo with us all right, now let's get back to the show. I was gonna say that, that it sounds like you're underpricing a bit, Billy. Yeah, could be, <laughs> could be, I'll look into that. I like how into it, I think they, the way they position this service, and correct me if I'm wrong, they were like, there's so many businesses that aren't using anybody that we're trying to gobble up like the small business owners that aren't using any accountants. And then if I were to read between the lines, and this is maybe unfair 
to, to a certain degree, but they're like, we're going to give you this basic commodity. If you want calls, it's probably not, you're probably not going to really like it. So they're like, oh, if they come to us, it's like a stepping stone to come to a professional firm like, like yours. I don't know if that's exactly panned out, but it's been an interesting relationship as they've launched the launched the service. Yeah, it's similar to the, they're serving the, the accounting needs in the same way that H&R Block is serving tax needs for that segment yeah. of person. That's a good way to put it. Doesn't see, I don't see any value in this. I know that I need to get it done. So I'm just going with the lowest bidder. I know the person's most likely incompetent or whatever the case is. I know I'm not gonna have any relationship. I'm not gonna be able to ask any questions, but I'm so smart. I don't need to ask anybody any questions because all this stuff is so easy. So for those people, they can go and be with Intuit or be with HR Block, and that's totally fine. Most CPAs would agree that they don't want those people as clients anyway. Yeah. Now, with your structure, you have subscription, you've come, you've backed into this price, and but you do this unlimited call, reach out to us anytime. So, how do you then think about team schedules and capacity? Are you, do you use like a client per staff ratio, revenue per staff ratio? Do you use, do you still, Look at budgeted time. Do you track time? How do you think about schedules in this world? We do track time, but what we do with that data is really not much. So we do look at it once a year. We have this big project where our office manager goes through and we will find one or two outliers like, hey, there's something going on here. Like, why is this taking so much time? But for the most part, we stay on top of it during the course of the year. Staff will come to me and they'll say, hey, this guy is. He keeps opening up all these bank accounts. He has 15 different bank accounts. He's transferring money all over the place. This is becoming a nightmare of a job. It should take an hour and last quarter, it took me four hours or something like that, or maybe even more. So we stay on top of it as we go. We don't let things get out of control over long periods of time. So it's really more of a feel thing. Yeah. And as far as staffing with the, with staffing new clients to my existing staff, again, it's really just a feel thing. Our office is small enough. We know that this person is busier than this person, or this client's personality would be a better fit for this staff member compared to this one. And we're making those judgment calls as we go. We haven't had the need to formalize anything yet. Great. So uh, to transition into team management, you mentioned you're just like feeling, keeping pulse. Do you have any recurring meetings with the team or is it ad hoc or how do you think about the team management? So it's totally ad hoc. But uh, it's funny you bring this up because we just had our tax season debriefing where I met with each staff mem member individually. We talked about what went right, what went wrong or whatever. And yep. almost everybody requested that next year, maybe even now, but next tax season, definitely we have at least a weekly meeting Monday mornings or whatever, just yep. to make sure that everybody gets on the same page for the week. Now that's something that I've always, I think I may have resisted it too much, but I just see all the waste in big corporate. <laughs> yeah. You hear people talking and it's become a meme at this point. Like everyone knows we're going to have a meeting about the meeting and all these sort of inefficiencies that are baked into big corporate culture. And I always tried to steer as far away from that as possible. But again, maybe I went a little too far and the ad hoc meetings maybe could be a little more formalized or a little more scheduled or predictable, but I think there is a balance there. And it's certainly not having meetings about meetings and four times a day we're on a zoom call. Yeah, I, I hear you. And I, I have a, I always try to st strive for that middle ground, but I would say I'm in similar boat, which is, do we need a meeting? So there's something about scheduled meetings that I also have a resistance to. And I think it's because two things, it's very easy for them to fall into a status meeting, which is you could have just emailed me everything you did or like, do right. you, this is, there's right. nothing I'm getting here that couldn't have been asynchronous. And then the other challenge with meetings is it turns the urgent into the important. It's because we're talking about it now, we want to find a resolution for it ASAP. But it's hard to then step back and be like, do we even need to solve this at all? Yes, it's an issue for this one client this one time. Is this an issue for all of our clients? Is it so totally so much of an issue that we need to solve it this week? Or or are we just trying to vent right now? And so it's really hard totally to great. navigate these conversations. Um, to jump around a little bit more with my style, you put up this post on LinkedIn. I just want to highlight it. I've mentioned it, oh my gosh, probably half a dozen times already. I thought it was so smart that you put out this boiler plate where you communicated to clients 
hey, it's not a big deal if you go into an extension. In fact, it's probably not, a, it's probably totally fine. I love the idea of sending a message. I forget when you send it, January of just being like, hey, dear business owner, firm owner, practitioner, you might want to go into extension. This is why it's not a big deal. Let me know if that's okay or agreeable on your end. Can you unpack that a little bit? Because I feel like so much like the accounting firm and the client feels like the last thing we want to do is a good into an extension. Well, why are you so worried about it? I don't know. It just sounds like a bad thing, right? It yeah. sounds like we miss something. We're going to still owe money. We're not getting our refund. So I guess I just unpack that a little bit because I just thought that was such a smart thing to send out to your clients. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, this just comes from, let's think about this logically. Let's get the first principles here and not just go with people don't like extensions. CPAs don't like extensions. Clients don't like extensions. Like why? What? Like what is going on here? Let's talk about it. And one of the things that I would hear from time to time is people, clients would say, oh, extend, that's how you get audited when you go on extension. I'm like, I go on extension every year. I don't get K-1s until the middle of September. So I have to go on extension every year. And I wouldn't agree to, I'm a CPA. Like I wouldn't agree to that if it was going to be an audit risk. <laughs> and in my experience, I've never seen, I haven't seen this correlation between going on extension and being audited. I just haven't seen it nor have I heard anyone actually talking about it. So this is just a rumor that needs to go away, right? It does not increase your likelihood of being audited. So that's the first thing. The, the other downside, potential downside to going on extension is if you owe money, that money needs to be paid by April 15th. Mm -hmm. So how do you know how much you owe unless you actually do your tax return? So for those people, extensions absolutely do not work. But because 99% of our personal tax returns that we do are business owner clients, and we do manage this business all year, we're advising them about making estimated tax payments all year. We also do this gigantic engagement in November and December. We do tax projections for all of our business clients. We do a mock tax return in November, December. We say, okay, we have 11 months of data, we're going to fire that in. We're going to make a really educated guess about what's going to happen in the month of December. We're going to get your spouse's pay stub. We're going to, we know your mortgage interest and your real estate tax. We know we can make a really, get the really close estimate of what this person's tax return is going to look like. We then advise them, hey, it looks like you're going to owe money. It looks like you're going to have a refund or whatever the case is. And if the person owes money, we have them make that as a fourth quarter payment, as a fourth quarter voucher. Mm -hmm. They're good. We know that when we do their tax return in February, March, April, August, we know that this person is going to be getting a refund. We're going to take that refund. We're going to apply it to the following year, right? Because you have to make a first quarter estimated tax payment that's due on April 15th. So let's take the burden off of the following year's tax payments and we're going to apply the, the previous year's overpayment. So when this person actually files their personal tax return, it's a total non-event. They don't owe money. They're not getting money back. Like they just have to docu-sign the e-file authorization form. And that's really the only way they know that their personal tax return actually got filed. So we look at our client list and we say, which people do we, first of all, which people do we know are overpaid? Which people do we know for sure are not going to owe money when we do their 1040? Now we have that list of people. And then within that list, which people can we have this sort of radical conversation with that, hey, extensions are actually okay. Would you be willing to go on extension? And most time people are like, I don't care at all. Like, why would I care? Based on what you're telling me, like, why would I care at all? Now, again, some people, they might need a tax return because they're refinancing or they need to fill out the FAFSA form or whatever. It's totally valid, right? But for the people that don't have a need, if we can take some of the work off our plates in March, and shift it to July when we're way slower, we're yeah. smoothing out our workflow. And that sounds like something that CPA firm owners would be interested in doing. Again, I don't understand the, the resistance to this, but I think that if people were to take a hard look at it, they would see there is definitely something here for that small subset of client. Yeah, but it's still meaningful. And even if it is a small percentage, it's still, it's still worth it. And anything can help, right? Anything can oh. help it, it, during tax season. Final question before we wrap up, you listed in the form these magical two letters, which have become like 
Oh my gosh, like catnip for anybody reading anything in the industry right now. One of these the letters AI. We're coming actually off of, I know this interview is going to go live in probably a couple months. We're going off of the recent release too of, they just did their chat 4.0 release, GBT 4.0, where they have translation. They have all these things that are coming. They have the desktop app where you can now upload files and talk to files, any files. So I'm really excited where this goes. I didn't mean to be so facetious about the words, but you mentioned something of how you're using it in your firm. So I'm curious, how are you leveraging it? How are you tinkering with it? Does that look like for you? Yeah. So I think tinkering is a really appropriate word. I'm all in on it. I think it's the coolest thing in the world using ChatGPT and Claude and Perplexity, which is a ser AI search engine. I have my five-year-old talking into my phone, trying to get him like, <laughs> hey, yes, I had my five-year-old. I had my five-year-old. I think we talked about this when we met up in New yeah. York City. Like at my five-year-old, I just, if anybody hasn't downloaded the mobile app and just hit, the microphone might be free now, but they had the audio version. And I would just ask my son, I was like, ask it anything. And of course he was like, make a song about this. And he had questions about like animals. And he just had, honest to goodness, a conversation. It was like, yeah. it wasn't weird for him. It was crazy for me. Cause I'm like, yeah, I didn't tell him how to use it. He just talked to it. Yes. But it's the, it's that context. Like, hey, just start talking and they will start talking. Whereas most adults. We have our biases and we're set in our ways. And when you show them chat GPT and you say, ask it anything, it's going to ask like these really pedestrian, like what's the capital of Pennsylvania? Okay. Like, you could use Google for that. That's not really what this, this thing is for. So yeah. I think it's the coolest thing in the world and it's obviously going to be the future. It's not going anywhere. That said, I'm not ready to implement AI to start doing client work yet. Regulators haven't gotten their hooks into it yet. So it's the wild west out there. So I'm not comfortable putting in any sensitive information, social security numbers or banking information or anything like that. So that's not happening. So once you take that off the table, then the conversation usually turns to maybe it could help me like write blog posts or do marketing, which it absolutely can do also. And then other people are using it to alleviate their staff from having to do these repetitive mundane tasks. There's that also, but what I'm really using it for more than anything, what I'm using AI more than anything is I'm using it as a creative brainstorming partner. So I'm thinking about it. Like, what if I had my best friend sitting next to me all day long and that best friend happened to be the smartest entity that's ever lived and has access to the world's information within milliseconds when we are like just business stuff. Like if we have to hire an intern, I'll prompt chat GBT or Claude, or I'll, I'll prompt AI and say, Hey, this is what we're thinking about doing. Well, you give it the context. Here's a profile of my firm. Here's the staff that we have. Here's the clients that we have. Like we're located here and all this other stuff. And then once it has all that context then we'll say, okay, I'm, I'm thinking about hiring an intern. What do you think? And it'll just start spitting out all these ideas about hiring an intern going to a job fair versus posting on LinkedIn or someplace else. And then also things like, should we get two part-time interns or one full-time intern? And they have all these ideas. Now, a lot of the ideas aren't good or they're irrelevant, but for me to be two or three minutes to read through these responses and maybe of one out of 10 times, you land on something that you would not have thought of on your own. Yeah. And then you implement that. And now you're in a completely different spot than you were had you not prompted AI for it. Now, in this internship example, I love this. When you when it shows like local job fairs, in any of the models that you've been using, you spoke of three, Complexity, Claude, and ChatGBT, would any of them list out local events or would you then look at Google to see, okay, let me see if there's any local job fairs coming up? So my experience with ChatGBT and Claude is mixed. I feel like... Sometimes it will search the web and other times it won't search the web. You get that message like, oh, my data is uh, stopped in 2021. I can't right. have access to anything after that. But then other times you can penetrate that and it will give you information, stuff that's happening currently. But perplexity is a search engine. That's what it does. It does search the web. So it will come up with events or recent articles or whatever. So I'm using perplexity as a Google replacement, essentially. And then ChatGBT and Claude more as that brainstorming partner, like I said. Yeah. And then one can imagine if you're like, okay, job fairs. Yeah, I, yeah, I totally forgot about that. I'm going to have to 
I want to reach out to the manager of the job fair, maybe the school administrator, if it's a school related job fair, and I want to reach out and see if I can booth there, or I want to write up a job ad, like all of those things can give you as many iterations as you want for any, anything you need to write, it could generate content, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It could give you interview questions. If you say, okay, these are the characteristics that we're looking for in an intern or in a hire or whatever the case is, here's the core values and here's what we find to be important. Give me 20 interview questions based on those criteria. And of those 20, maybe you can get two or three that you're like, this is a really good question here. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm, yeah, I'm very curious to see where this goes, especially with the recent update. It'd be fun. They're going to have to work through all kinds of copyright, how to scan for copyrights. But even the concept as you're trying to digest podcasts, books, uh, videos uploaded. Okay, throw this thing into one of these models, throw this book into there. And let me talk with the book. Let me work through the concepts yeah. and see how to apply it. I don't think we're that far off from doing small, small account, a couple dozen pages. I think you can do that, but for larger ones, and again, they have to work through copyright, but I think it's, it's certainly coming, right? And I haven't even tinkered with the latest model from OpenAI either, but it's been fun. It's been fun to play with. And I think there's a lot of utility there. Billy, there's a million things I can ask you, but this has been fun and, and we're wrapping up on time. If somebody wants to reach out, follow your work, connect with you, what's the best way for them to do? I would say LinkedIn probably be the best. Billy Angelo, CPA on LinkedIn. Our website is angelocpafirm.com. Fantastic. If you couldn't jot down all the notes from today's interview, we went through offboarding clients, we went through pricing, went through capacity, went through AI, we went through so many different things. You can always go to jetpackworkflow.com slash blog, jetpackworkflow.com slash blog. And we'll do a full write-up of the interview. We'll link everything up. We'll link up your LinkedIn. Say that fast five times. So everything will be there. If you enjoyed today's interview, leave a review. Helps us get the word out. And if Billy mentioned something that really ignited you, really lit you on fire, share it with us, share it with the firm owner, share it on social, tag us. We'll amplify it. Billy, it's been a treat for you to come on. I, I look forward to round two. David, this was great. Nice conversation. Thank you for joining Growing Your Firm the podcast series for global, small, and medium-sized businesses ready to scale and increase profits. You can check out more podcasts by following the links in the show notes. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you're listening. At Jetpack Workflow, we're all about maximizing returns for accounting firms and CPAs. Check out more podcasts on growing your firm and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts.